need pull as a source of innovation. There's another kind of innovation which sort of fits in the same space, very much again about needs, about demand pull, but this is called disruptive innovation. And this is very often a game-changing innovation, rewrites the rules, and it comes with working with unserved, people who can't get their jobs done, or poorly served needs. Think about, for example, the low-cost airline. It's a two-step process. First of all, entrepreneurs find an opportunity. Who doesn't fly yet but might? Now there's a need, so we could work with that. We've got to solve the problem in a different way. We have to innovate. But if we could come up with an idea that actually met their needs, we're doing fine. But the second part of disruptive innovation is to say that actually their needs, for example, low-cost flying, not only meet the needs of people who otherwise couldn't afford to fly, but they start to have a message for the mainstream. Hmm, I can get my flight much cheaper if I take one of these low-cost airlines. So it's this two-step process, and it's the second step which really leads to disruption, because the established players are used to meeting a different set of needs and have a lot of catching up to do. So that's essentially the pattern of disruptive innovation. It's a phrase we hear a great deal of, but it very much drives in terms of innovation opportunities. And another, again, related thing is the idea of learning from the edge. Whose needs are we interested in? And if we find a different and perhaps a challenging environment, it might take us down new innovation pathways. There's a lot of discussion these days of what's called frugal innovation, essentially not wasting resources, doing things simply where we can. And that's very much linked to very many people in the world where income is low sometimes called the bottom of the pyramid because there are many of them, but their purchasing power is low. But this approach to innovation, which was originally developed by the writer C.K. Prahalad, essentially says there's a potential market there if we can meet their needs in different ways. Innovate, which is very much the low-cost airline kind of story. So there's been a great deal of work on frugal innovation. For example, a car for people in India for the people who used to ride around on motorcycles, aspiring now to a car, well, that's a huge market, but it still can't cost the same as it does over in the West. And so a lot of companies, Tata Motors originally, and very much now Renault-Nissan, have been developing successful cars, like the Quid you can see here, which are essentially cars priced for people, just like Henry Ford did, but those people happen to be a much lower income bracket. So it's a very different model. And of course, this model of working with users at the bottom of the pyramid, people in emerging economies, is a powerful driver for change. We can come back again to look at this theme in more detail. Another example would be M-Pesa. M-Pesa is a way of giving people banking who otherwise couldn't use a bank. In East Africa, particularly in Kenya, M-Pesa provides a way of transferring money. It's a banking system, but it works across mobile phones using credits. And these days, it can be used for shopping and all sorts of other transactions. It's essentially mobile money. People have all sorts of financial jobs they want done. M-Pesa gives them a very different way of doing those jobs. So much so that over half the gross domestic product of Kenya now runs across M-Pesa. And we've already seen the field of humanitarian innovation also opens up very powerful opportunities, not just in meeting those people's needs, but in moving the innovation trajectory in new directions. And that also links to another source of innovation, opening up the envelope. Essentially, extreme conditions sometimes create an envelope which eventually mainstream innovation will follow. A good example would be the idea of anti-lock braking, ABS. Now, this originated not in the field of motor cars or bicycles at all. It was how do you stop something very big and very fast without it skidding? So if the runway is icy or slippery in some way and the plane slips because the brakes have skidded, there's a problem. So how do we stop that successfully? We develop something called anti-lock braking. And the principle of anti-lock essentially is quite a powerful technological one, but it solved the problem. That extreme case of how do you stop a very heavy airliner then becomes something that the rest of the industry, the car and transportation industry, can benefit from.
it opens up the envelope. So, one other area where there's a great deal of opportunity for innovation from the demand side is what's called mass customization. Henry Ford basically said the need at that time was for personal transportation, the motor car, but at a price people can afford, a car for every man. But these days we're much more interested in having particular customized solutions. And so mass customization is essentially all about individually tailoring things to our specific needs. And it applies to products, services or processes, a rich source of innovation where the challenge, the challenge is to try and meet individual needs. Now we can do this at a cosmetic level. So for example, uh, we can say personalized suites or personalized banking. They're basically the standard thing, but somebody's putting a label on them. That's fine, that's an element of customization. More difficult is what's called assembly level, where you actually put the thing together to meet the needs of a specific user. And that's a model that Dell Computers has made work for itself for many years. Essentially, you don't just buy a standard Dell box, you configure what you particularly need from a variety of elements, and essentially you are designing a system, or you're not designing, you're specifying a system which you actually want. Third level up is actually at the product level, and this is very much the principle that tailors have used for many, many years. Rather than buy a suit off the shelf, have one built up around you. The tailor measures, makes it, adapts it, discusses with you, essentially building the product around you, not a standard product. And at the extreme, the design level, where the, even the conception actually is something that is in the eye of the user or the mind of the user. This is an approach that Lego have taken to great effect, working with their users, mostly boys and girls, and saying, well, we've got ideas for the design of our products, but so do you have. Share those with us. Let's share them with the wider community. If there's enough interest, we'll start making these together. So many of Lego's users are now becoming active designers for Lego. So these are different levels of customization, but all of that customization area opens up opportunities, need pull opportunities for innovation. So let's summarize. We've seen that there are multiple sources of innovation and even within the need pull area, there are many different from the incremental right through to the radical. They're along our spectrum from exploit to explore. This applies in products, in services and processes. What about the push side is of course the question we then need to move on to. There's plenty of scope in understanding the demand side, necessity of various kinds as the mother of invention, but what do we know about the push side? That's the subject of the next film.